that the word used in this language for a non-African white person is a, and I quote, person who endlessly rushes around to no apparent purpose. <laughs> Ouch! Right? Sounds like someone who is definitely running on that hamster wheel, getting nowhere. I'm afraid it's a pretty accurate assessment of our propensity toward this on-the-go, gotta get ahead, do whatever is right for me culture. We live in it. We don't like to rely on others. We function all too often with this painfully individualistic, and I'm not going to sing it, I did it my way kind of attitude. That is until if you're like me, you're smacked in the face with the reality that doing it my way doesn't always work out very well. Or until you read something like Ecclesiastes, which confirms that this kind of life, this kind of I'm going to do it my way and get out of my way because it's just going to happen, leads to little more than futility and pain. Now, obviously, the Bible teaches that individuals are important to God. They really are. And our personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ is crucial Christ died for each one of us. We've heard it said it's true. If we were the only one, he still would have died for us. That's how much he loves us. Paul describes this love that Christ has as, he describes Christ as the one who loved me and gave himself for me. We are valuable to God as individuals. But I think we've distorted things a bit, making faith all about our personal relationship with the Lord in order to fit our current cultural priority of individual over community. In many ways, we have made it all about us, all about me. And I think that to that arrogant perspective, which is really what that is, the Bible screams a resounding no. No. Yes, the Bible is about individual people, but it's about people who are in relationship to God and in relationship to others. It's not just an individualistic view of getting myself to heaven. And it's not just about my relationship with God. It's also about right relationship with those who surround us in community. A year or so ago, we focused on the Jesus Creed in a sermon series. It's a creed that's lifted directly from the Torah, from the law in the Old Testament. It's taken from the book we call Deuteronomy. And in the Jesus Creed, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy in the New Testament. He quotes this passage saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. He quotes that. But then he adds to it out of Leviticus chapter 19, saying the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Love God, love others, top of the list, top of the charts. Nothing supersedes those two laws. Christianity from the start has been about relationship to God and relationship to one another. And we cannot eliminate the mandate for community. Now, I realize that on the surface, this may seem to fly in the face of what many of us have been raised to believe, whether inside the church or outside the church, and how we're currently ordering our lives. But secular individualism has nothing to do with the Bible. And if I may, neither does religious individualism. Faith and faithfulness are not simply, as in many evangelical circles, I have been guilty of this at times too, the way that we inaccurately either teach or the, the message that we unintentionally give or the way that we live. It is about our relationship through God, in God through Jesus Christ. That's what we often say it's all about. And as central as that is, it is not the whole story. It's about that relationship, which is crucial, and meaningful connections in community. And when we focus on one without the other, 
There are churches that focus on the meaningful relationships. I kind of grew up in a church like that, but they don't get the Jesus part so much. They're missing it too. It's about both of these parts of who we are created in the image of God working together. It's an ideal that God has for us, for the world, and it's an ideal that goes all the way back, are you ready for it, to before God created us. Strange as it sounds, community existed when only God existed. Holy heavy theology, Batman. Did you get that? Community existed when only God existed. God is a community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is three and God is one at the same time. And the three persons of the Trinity, which is what we call the biblical word for three and one, theological word for three and one, not biblical, they get along. They get along. They work together. They like each other. They are in community together. The Trinity is one of the most mysterious realities. It's complex. It's hard for us to wrap our brain around. We're going to take some time to do that in, the, uh, in a couple of months as we have a, ser- a sermon series on the Trinity, which I'm really looking forward to. For now, it's important to know that all three parts of the Trinity were involved in creation from the very beginning. All three of them. They were cooperating. They were working together, operating as a community. We see that in Genesis. Which means that God is God, is the community from which all other communities get their start. God values community so much because it is so much a part of who he is. He knows how awesome it is. He wants us to experience it, and he created us for it. There is no reality that existed before community because nothing existed before God. Buildings and nations, even the physical pieces of nature around us, will not carry into eternity. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. But community, the community of the church, carries over into the eternal future. There is no reality that existed before community. There is no reality that will exist beyond community or last longer than community. I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but in Genesis, when you read the creation story, after each thing that God creates, day, night, air, sea, land, animals, fish, birds, all of those, the different things that it talks about, what does he declare it? He declares it good, right? Until he gets to the creation of man. Not people, man. Now, I have to be very careful here. I am a woman up here preaching about this. But please hear me. At the point at which he creates man, he declares it not good. Now, I want to be clear. God didn't sit there and think, oh, we totally blew it with that one. Adam, what were we thinking? We should have stopped with a yak. <laughs> right? That's not what we're saying here. It was the not being with anybody. It was the man is alone that was not good about the creation of man. And so what does God do? He creates woman out of man because that is the perfect companion. Gilbert Bilizekian, in his book, he's a New Testament scholar who who taught at Wheaton uh, College for many, many years. In his book, which is a great read, Community 101, highly recommend it, he says woman was created in order to rescue man, in order to help man out of being alone. That together, God intended for them to form community. And as if that weren't enough, almost immediately, what does God say? Go expand the community. 
Make more of you. Be fruitful. Multiply. Build the community. Make lots of little yous. Right? God's love, I hope, for community is, I hope, obvious. He is community. He creates community. And he expects that we will be a part of community. Which is why Ecclesiastes tells us, it gives us the other, paints the other picture for us, saying that a wise person is one who is involved with others, who has people to love and to be loved by, who invests in relationships. That's where wisdom is found, in, in investing in that kind of community. Now I know that the, I love how the text here, in, starting in verse 9, describes the benefits and the um, kind of joys of this kind of community. It's, it's, it's wonderfully worded. First in verse 9, it says, two working together have a good return for their labor. This is not hard to figure out. That whatever the toil or the trouble that the two face, having a companion will always help things, and the return for the labor will always be greater than if one tries to do whatever it is on their own. All right, that's verse 9. And then in verses 10, and 12, 10 to 12, 10, 11, and 12, the writer shifts to the benefits of companionship as it relates to the hazards of traveling. Now you might be thinking, well, there aren't all that many hazards in traveling, but we have to remember, this was written at a time when traveling was far more treacherous than it is now. There were no comfy cars with DVD players and heated seats that I drove last or Easter week, a week after Easter, to Illinois and back in. I was very thankful for DVD player on that 13-hour drive each way. But they didn't have that back when this was being written. There was no state police or AAA to come help them out if they got into a pickle. There was no Hotel 6 or Hampton Inn to go stay in when it got cold at night and they didn't want to keep driving. Travel at this time involved a lot of walking on a really rough roads with the potential for cold nights and huge hazards all along the way. And the author uses that reality, one that his audience would have totally understood, to convey the benefits of companionship and to talk about the journey of life, to extrapolate out of just this physical journey on a road, to talk about the journey of life and how it's better when we've got people with us on that journey. Verse 10 talks about pits and ravines that one might fall into. Verse 11 speaks of cold nights. Verse 12 warns about potential attacks along the way and how if there's somebody else with us, we can, we can um, kind of huddle together and we can fend off so that we're not overtaken or overcome more, much more easily than if we're by ourselves. The point, all of these things in life, adversity, hostility, common struggles, error, mishap, they're all better when we face them with others. And then we get to the last statement. We had to turn the page for it, which is kind of fitting because it sort of doesn't fit with the rest of what he's saying. All along, we've been talking about two strands, right? And now the author shifts and he starts talking about three strands. I've always loved this verse and I've always kind of looked at it with the lens. Maybe you're like me if you've read this that interpreted it through the lens of like, oh, God is the third strand. All right, the author's kind of shifting out to a little bigger perspective. God is that third strand, at least for those who are following him, and the idea that our relationships, that our, our, our uh, connections with other people, what really holds them together and keeps them strong is God as the third party. This was one of the verses that was used in Judd's and my wedding, and we were challenged to Always keep God at the center of our marriage to make him that third strand, to recognize that for our marriage to be strong, we needed to keep him at the center and make him a huge part of it. And that is entirely true. I have used this verse as I've officiated weddings. I think it's appropriate to do so. I think it's not wrong to read it that way. But I think that there's another angle to what the author might be saying here. The idea of adding a third strand to a rope shifts the conversation toward this bigger community, right? Toward the idea that our circle of support and connections need to go beyond just me and one other person. That we need the community. We need a whole lot of each other's. We don't just need each other. We need each other. Does that make sense? This is one of the core values of Central that I love. Authentic Christian community. 
people coming alongside each other, doing life together, supporting each other. It's one of the greatest gifts that you as a church family give to each other, that you give to me and to my family, that we have the privilege of giving back. Um, It's more important than our sermons. It's more important than our programming. The community that is built. Let's take a minute and hear from one member of our community, Sandy Finch. She's had a rough year. It's been a long year, and she's a longtime member of Central and a faithful follower of Jesus, and I want to hear, let you hear how she has experienced the blessing of meaningful connections. Take a look. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Mandy. Um, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you and your husband Al came to Central? Yes, uh, we came to uh, Baltimore from Pennsylvania uh, when Al was transferred in his job. And uh, of course we knew we wanted to find a church home immediately uh, when we came here. Um, it took us just a little while to find Central but when we came through the doors and we found everyone so welcoming and friendly, we knew also that we had found our church home. Mm-hmm. So how has the community at Central played a role in your life? Oh my goodness, they have in so many different ways. Um, making us feel like we really belonged here. Uh, we've made many good friends over the years. and. Uh, And of course, they've been very supportive uh, of us when we needed them too. But uh, our friends at Central soon became our social friends also. And we've been very grateful for each one of them. So how have these friends of yours at Central become more like family Mm. than what American culture might consider the church? (laughs) Well, I can answer that in many ways probably. But uh, as you know, Al's uh, cancer returned uh, this last spring when he had surgery. They found that it was, had come back. And uh, our friends just came around us in so many ways. We felt the Christian community uh, just everywhere. And uh, when Al was in the hospital, uh, many came to the hospital. Of course, they prayed with us, and Al enjoyed visiting with them. And uh, as his cancer progressed, uh, they uh, provided meals for us and uh, came to the house also and uh, they were just there uh, whenever we needed them and uh, you know what a witness to our family Mm -hmm. uh, too see yeah it was wonderful so tell us a little bit more about that time did you reach out to central for support no central came to us Mm. and in so many ways as i have just mentioned, uh, but uh, especially later in the summer uh, when the cancer had spread so and Al was so sick, um, meals came to us every evening. Um, I think our children were just kind of blown away the way people, they did call ahead of time, but just every evening they arrived with a lovely dinner for us, which was so helpful. And uh, of course, uh, Al, was so appreciative, uh, too, of all the support uh, that he received, too. And then even at the very last, when uh, Al went to Gilchrist uh, for a few days uh, before his life ended, uh, many, many came. It was just almost like a constant stream of people mm-hmm. coming in to say their goodbyes mm-hmm. and, to, and there again to support us. Yes, yes. So. Is there anything, when you think back along the years that you and Al had here together, mm-hmm. being involved in the community at Central, mm-hmm. is there anything that you wish you had done differently, a time that you had been, wish you had been more involved? Mm-hmm. It's hard to think of that, um, Mandy, because um, we were involved, um, and we loved being involved. Mm-hmm. Um, we loved doing what we did, and, um, and we received so much support mm-hmm. uh, from others uh, too, but also uh, we got acquainted with people that maybe we had never known mm. uh, before. And uh, it was a, a very special time in our lives. I think uh, we think back now uh, and 
we know that God brought us to Central. Yeah. So one more question. Mm -hmm. What would you want someone who was in their 20s, who was considering being involved in a church community, um, maybe just starting out as an independent adult, what would you mm -hmm. want them to know about the importance of community? Mm -hmm. Well, I would tell them, uh, of course, to find uh, a church home where they felt comfortable, where uh, the word was being preached every Sunday, and where people reached out to them and where they found people that they could reach out to also. Because a church family is very important, uh, not only at the very beginning uh, as a young person, but through um, all the years of your life. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you. Friends, when we prioritize people and connections over positions and power and possessions. We're living into who and what we're created to be. Deeply connected to those around us, loving them, being loved by them, going to them, not having to have them ask, learning from them, teaching them, reflecting Jesus to them. Will we always do it well? Of course not. <laughs> we'll mess up, we'll hurt each other, and hopefully we'll forgive each other. But if there's any hope that Jesus brings to community, I think it's this. That in community centered on him, we don't need to be perfect. We don't need to have our stuff together before we engage with others. We don't always need to try and keep one step ahead so that we look like we're more put together than we are. What we need is to commit to be there for each other, to bear one another's burdens, to love each other the best that we know how in the moment, and to remember to keep God, who is the author of community, at the center of it all. And if we do, we will find help in our times of need, like Sandy, we will find people to come around us in our greatest hour of sorrow. We will also experience the joy of companionship when life is joyful. I mean, our text talks about, it doesn't matter how great life is, if you don't have anybody to share it with, it's miserable. So the charge is simple. This is not rocket science. Get involved in community. Get involved in people's lives. Let people into your life. Resist isolation. Live in ways that rub against the grain of our horribly individualistic culture. Get to know your neighbors. Talk to your colleagues about more than just work. Invest in relationships with folks here at church through small groups and through the myriad of other ways you can get involved with people here. Take a risk. Put yourself out there. I think it's worth it. And more importantly, I know God believes it's worth it. Let's pray. God, thank you for calling us to community, even in those moments when we'd rather just be by ourselves. Thank you that you don't leave us by ourselves to journey through life. Thank you that you have not called us to be hermits. God, thank you that we can learn from you and in you that you are the author of community because you are community. God, we don't always do community well, and I ask that you would Forgive us for those moments when we put ourselves above others. God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to live into the call to be connected in meaningful relationships. with The people in our families, people in this church, people around us in our neighborhoods, at our places of work, on the playgrounds, wherever we are. And meaningful connection with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. 
in whose name we pray. Amen. One of the ways that we um, contribute to the community and what God's doing in this place is that we have the opportunity to give back a bit of what God um, has given to us. We, as I said in the, earlier in the service, believe it's part of our worship to offer back to God a portion of what he's given to us. Again, if you're a guest, that connection card is the best thing you can put in that offering plate for us. Um, the uh, ushers are going to come from the, work from their, the back and work forward. Once they have passed your, your aisle, go ahead and um, uh, stand up and join us in worship. Let's give out of the gener with generous hearts grateful for what God has blessed us with.
Amen. And in the context of community, in the celebration of community, we together get to close this worship service singing a song that praises our one God, the God that we all share, the God that we all love, the God that we all worship together. So let's celebrate with joy this morning.
You all know it, but our community at Central extends beyond the walls of Central. And one of our longtime friends is with us this morning. Barbara Rowe, would you come on up here? <laughs> Barbara is one of us who has gone from here, how many years ago? Four years ago now. Four years ago now, and is in San Salvador, in, in El Salvador, um, living and loving the people in community that God has put her in with, with down there and helping them understand God's love and helping to fight injustices and violence um, in San Salvador, which is a pretty violence-ridden place, mm -hmm. and attempting to be the light and the love of Jesus and teach people that our God is love and that God calls us to love one another. And so um, I want to pray for Barbara, but before I do, I want to let you know that you have an opportunity to not have to make lunch and to get to hear more about what Barbara's doing, there's a lunch in the, um, that right after um, this service. So if you are able to, stick around and um, hear what she's doing. It's exciting stuff, and I would, I would encourage you to, to make yourself available for that. Um, but for now, I want to pray for you and with you and um, just ask God's blessing on you. Lord God, thank you for Barbara. Thank you for her commitment to you and for her uh, love for Jesus. Thank you that she longs to serve you well and to... Uh, be in community with those in San Salvador who desperately need to know of your love. And I pray, God, that you would um, equip her, strengthen her, keep her healthy, love her, surround her with community that I know you have who are with her in this mighty task. God, help her to know that you go before her, that you walk with her every step of the way. God, help her to hear your voice and to uh, rely on the community that she has with you as she is faithful in the community in which you put her. God, would you bless her and keep her? Would you make your face to shine on her as she serves you? And God, thank you for keeping the connections with Central Strong. And I pray that you would bless this community as we seek to bless Barbara as she seeks to bless. And it goes on and on. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. One of the other ways that we get to care for each other in community is by praying for each other. So we have prayer ministers on the wings here ready to pray um, with any of you who might want to take advantage of that today. They consider it a privilege. Um, it's one of the greatest ways we can support each other in community. So um, know that they are available. And now receive the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and go with you all now and forever. Amen and go in peace.